Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to do a deep dive into this Canon EOS R7 through the lens of a bird photographer. We're going to start by going through all these buttons and all these dials. What do they do stock out of the box? How can you modify them to make this even better for bird photography? We'll talk about the electronic viewfinder, the LCD screen. Beginners are certainly welcome here. I'm going to go nice and slow. Then we're going to go into this thing. This is the Canon menu system. It's three layers deep. There's over 450 different menu items. It's very complicated, but we don't have to do too much tweaking to it, thank goodness. There are two settings for sure we have to change or you will send this back for bird photography if you don't make these changes because it won't work very good. And then we'll go into this quick menu or this quick control menu and you can see we have two columns of icons. It's abbreviated form of the menu system and I'll show you how to pare that down and get rid of a lot of that stuff so it just has the stuff you want in there. Then we'll do an, a deep dive into the autofocus system. So autofocus system is really, really important. For example, here are the eight different autofocus points. They're also called autofocus methods. They used to be called that. They're called autofocus areas and autofocus points in the manual of this camera. I like to call them autofocus boxes because really they're, every single one of them is a box. So we'll go through those, show you how they work, stock out of the box, show you when you should be using certain ones and when you shouldn't be using certain ones. And then we'll see how they're affected by this monster right here. This is subject tracking. So this is new. Uh, you turn this on and the camera is absolutely amazing for tracking the eye or face of a bird as long as the background isn't too complicated. If the background gets complicated, this can be a real pain in the butt. I'll show you how to deal with it and we'll see how this affects the eight different autofocus points. It completely changes them and really wipes out two important ones, spot autofocus and single point autofocus boxes are both wiped out by it. So we'll talk about it. Last but not least, we'll go through some button modifications. I'll show you how I have this set up. I have over 6,000 pictures with this camera. I'm very well versed in it right now. And we'll be putting some of those up as we go through. Uh, bottom line of the camera, it's an amazing camera. It's a 32.5 megapixel APS-C sensor, which is perfect for bird photography. Remember those type of sensors, the pixels are crammed into the center more and around the, the periphery of the sensor, the, the pixel density is not quite as great, but that's fine for bird photography because the birds are often small and they're not super big in the frame anyway, and we usually crop that away so it doesn't bother us. There are no APS-C lenses for this camera yet, but that's okay as well because who cares if the outer periphery of the lens doesn't shine on the sensor because we usually don't use that anyway. So I get some amazingly sharp images, just as sharp as my much more expensive EOS R5. So very happy with it so far. So let's go to the next section. All right, guys, I think we should start out by doing a factory reset or a semi-factory reset with this camera. Let's all do one thing in case I forget to mention this in the next section. This is the mode dial up here. Let's all switch that into manual mode. Okay, so we're just all on the same page. And now let's do a semi-factory reset so we're really all on the same page. So go into the menu, and this is the menu. I might as well introduce it right now. Across the top, you have the main menu categories. Under each main menu icon, you have a whole bunch of submenus that are in the form of numbers. Under each number, there are sub submenus that are at the actual menu items. So that's the way this works. To do a semi-factory reset, let's start off by going to the little camera here and let's go to the submenu number five. It says clear all custom functions. Just click this Q button right here or the set button and then you can use this as the cross key pad right here. It's a directional pad. It's got an up, down, left and right cross key and you can just hit the right cross key and then push the Q button again, and there we go. It's reset, but we're not done yet, so don't go away from this section just yet. Now let's go to the wrench menu, and let's go over to number six, submenu, 
and go up to reset camera, hit the Q or the set button, go into basic settings, and let's do a reset there. Great, we're not done yet. Go back into menu and let's go back to the wrench. Let's go back to number six. Go back to reset camera. Let's go to other settings. Customize quick control settings. Yes, let's reset that. Shooting display info. We can reset that. Communications I don't mess with in this video. I'm not going to show you the custom shooting modes. Copyright, we don't have to worry about that. Customize controls. Definitely reset that. And customize functions, definitely reset that. My menu, reset that. Great, we are all on the same page. Let's go to the next section. All right, guys, in this section, let's go through the external features of this camera and all these buttons and dials and show you what they do. I think it's best to start with this thing. This is the electronic viewfinder. Uh, it's very cool. It's the same in all of these mirrorless cameras. It is showing you a picture of what the sensor is actually seeing. So what you see is what you get when you take the picture. If I take the picture here, that's the picture. It's exactly what you see in here. So this is very cool. Not like DSL cameras, right? What you see through here is not necessarily what you get. You have to keep checking to see what the exposures were. This shows you the exposures. And I'm going to fix this. Give me a second. I'm going to fix this power on and off. We'll go over that when the time comes, but be right back. All right, great. Now this thing's not going to go into sleep mode and we can continue. Um, so yeah, electronic viewfinder, very cool. There are a few problems with it, however. The way it's set up stock settings, like if you just got it out of the box or you just did the factory reset with us, for birds in flight, it's going to stutter. It's going to show you a picture and then the black picture, picture, black picture. So it's like an old 1920s movie. So I'll show you how to correct that or semi-correct that problem. But also with regard to the depth of field, it always shows you the, the shallowest depth of field that is possible with the lens you have on. I believe the aperture is 1.8 on this. So it's got a pretty shallow depth of field. And even though I'm at 5.6 here, which I can actually raise up just to kind of clarify the point here. So I don't know if you can see the ego very well in the background, but it's pretty blurry, right? So that's that means that we have a very shallow depth of field, but that's not where I am, right? I'm at F11 right here. So that should be clear in the background. That's a very deep depth of field, deep enough to get the three or four rows of animals we have here. So there's a button on the front. If I push that button, See how the eagle snaps into shape? So that's the true depth of field. That's called the depth of field preview button. So if you're into depth of field, you might play with that. I'll show you how to permanently set that up so you don't have to worry about that. It'll always show you the correct depth of field in a second. This is an LCD screen here, just run of the mill. Again, this shows you what the sensor is actually seeing. The, sh the sensor is being exposed to all the light right now. And that can present a problem with mechanical shutter mode uh, that we'll talk about soon. So that's the story there. Let's go over these buttons now. All right, guys, depth of field button. I'll put a picture rather than spin this around. I don't uh, think you can see it that well. So I'll just put a picture up now. That's the depth of field button. I just demonstrated if you push that in, it'll show you the true depth of field. Around the button, we have a switch that switches between manual focus and autofocus. That is absolutely very cool and well appreciated. If you're shooting with older glass, the EF line, a lot of them don't have these switches on the lens and therefore you have to go into the menu and you forget where the setting is. It's a real pain. So it's really nice to have this here. If your lens already has a manual focus autofocus on it, then this is turned off. It doesn't work. I have a RF35 lens on here right now, and it has one of those buttons, so it doesn't work. But that's what that's all about. Now, moving up, the first button we should talk about is the workhorse of this camera, and that is the shutter button. Notice if I half press the shutter down, it locks whatever focus box is set to default. It locks that one on. 
the target, it turns green. That tells you that the picture you're about to take will be in focus. Full press the shutter and you got yourself a picture. When I take a picture, it actually displays the picture for two seconds. So that's annoying. We can turn that off, but that's, that's okay. I'll show you how to do that in a little while. Okay, so that is the shutter button. It's kind of a flimsy, plasticky feeling button. I mean, it's not terrible, but it's not like the R5s. And I shot over 5,000 images uh, on Sunday. And by the end of the day, my finger was getting a little tired. And I was like, oh, God, I can notice it's like scraping when I push down. And not the greatest button, but this is a $1,500 camera. The US R5 is almost a $4,000 camera. So Canon had to save money somewhere. And it's definitely on these buttons and dials where they save some money because they're not the greatest. But that is the shutter button. All right, let's skip over this little one and talk about another workhorse right here. This is called the main dial, and you use this to control shutter speed. Remember the basics of photography. If you slow the shutter speed down too much, it lets too much light hit the sensor, then the image will be overexposed. This is a perfect example of an overexposed image. If I take the picture, because the viewfinder doesn't lie, if I take the picture and we look at it, it's blown out or it's overexposed, right? If we go the other way, if we make the shutter speed too fast, then not enough light hits the sensor and then the image is underexposed if we take it, right? So you want it just right. And that's one of the beauties with this electronic viewfinder is you can have a really good idea of what the exposure is going to be. Okay, so that is a workhorse. Uh, this main dial also will serve many other purposes. If we hit other buttons, like if we hit the MFN button, now it becomes an ISO dial. And actually, we're going to talk about that one next. So let's talk about this MFN button. Stands for multi-function button. And you can set up many things with this button. It's I like the button because it's very ergonomically placed. Remember, you hold your camera. When your eye's in the viewfinder, you'll hold the camera like this. So your finger is right on the shutter dial. Your wrist doesn't have to bend or do anything crazy to cause maybe carpal tunnel. Uh, and it's just a good ergonomic position. But this little MFN button is right there. So I want to assign something I'm constantly changing to this MFN button. Um, same with the, the main dial. It's very ergonomically placed. These other buttons are not so ergonomically placed. But what does the MFN button do? Let's push it down and see. You can see that there's five or maybe even six submenus underneath there. By default, you're on the ISO submenu, and all of these reassign these menus to the main dial. So if I push that button, you can see it does time out. If I push that button, stock out of the box, I can control my ISO right here. So that is very cool. In a way, I don't particularly like to hit a button and then go turn a wheel. I like to just be able to do it like with this dial. Here's the quick control dial, and I'm going to set that, ultimately set that up for my ISO. But you can do whatever you want. First, we're going over the basics. So, MFN button. If I hit it again and I move this quick control dial, we can toggle through the other menus here. So, we have drive mode right here we'll talk about. One shot. Here's your white balance. Um, there is exposure compensation, I believe. And yeah, we don't need all those things there. And the problem with this is when I first got the camera, I tried to leave ISO right here because it was so convenient and I'm always manipulating it. But what I was finding is I was accidentally turning this dial with my thumb and throwing it out of whack. And then when the next bird came up and I wanted to change ISO, I was like, oh my God, what in the heck's going on? I'm on, I'm on some weird exposure compensation. So I will show you how to get rid of all these other ones except for the one you want, ISO or one shot or whatever. I'll show you how to get rid of those. They're really easy so you don't accidentally throw things off. All right, moving back, we have a movie on and off button here with a little red dot in it. If I just push that, I immediately go into movie shooting mode. And not only that, it's started. It's recording right now. So to stop it, you just hit that again. And now we're back in the stills mode. And Stills means the picture taking mode. Stills mode, picture taking mode. Movie mode is the movie mode. All right, we have an ISO button right here. So this is the dedicated ISO button. So if we hit that, a huge menu pops up. And again, the main 
dial is reassigned and we can scroll between that and select our ISO. What's the problem, the obvious problem with this? It's too big, Canon. It blocks the whole view. Uh, I mean, maybe some people like that, but my eye is always in this viewfinder and I don't want this giant menu taking away almost half of the viewfinder. Uh, the other problem is ergonomics. So if this is my shooting position, I can't reach it. My finger doesn't go back past this, this main dial. Maybe some of you younger people with more flexible fingers, that's no problem. But for me, it's a no-go. If it's on a tripod, and then I'm not really in that shooting position, then that's fine. Uh, but for me, this button does nothing. I can't assign it because I don't want to stir up my bad wrist. All right, what's next? We went over the mode dial already. You can switch between different modes. For this video, we're going to be in the manual exposure. I always shoot in full manual. I don't, I don't even use auto ISO. And I mean, some people, we don't need to get in an argument about that. I just prefer to have full control over this camera. So that's what that is. Uh, then we have a nice little switch right here. So they move the on off switch to the top here in this little semi dial thing. I really like it a lot. So let's see how fast it comes on. 1001, 1002, about two seconds. So that's great. It comes on fast. It's very convenient. When you first get the camera, you have to be careful about getting too excited if you're walking through the woods. Oh, you see a vermilion flycatcher, which are back here in San Jose. We're very excited. This is the second year they're, they've returned to the area. There's just one of them that I know of, so I'm going after that one this weekend. So if I get too excited, I might hit that too hard. And not only did I turn it on, I turned it in movie mode. And I'm trying to take a picture frantically, and it's in movie mode. So be careful about overturning that. Um, and talking about movie mode, let's go into movie mode. Now we have full control. When you switch it on, it doesn't start automatically. To start it, you have to push this little red button right there. And that starts things up and just push it again, and that turns things off. But you have full control here. Uh, we control the shutter speed and the aperture and the ISO is on auto. We can get that off auto. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty cool. I really like this a lot. All right, moving to the back of the camera. So we have a gigantic dial. We kind of talked about this already. This dial is called the quick control dial. You can just call it the dial. It has a joystick in the center. That's called the multi-controller. Can't we just call it joystick uh, or multi-controller, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but what does that thing do? So if I pull up an autofocus box, let's pull one up here that actually is more box like there's the one point autofocus box I can move that around the, the screen uh, by controlling this joystick if you get stuck over here and want to jump back to the middle the exact middle of the viewfinder and what I see through the viewfinder is exactly what you, you see through the screen here if you put your eye in here there's a little sensor see how that turns that on and off but if you want to jump back to the center all you do is push this joystick or multi-controller straight in. And again, it's kind of a plasticky feel. Sometimes you have to push it a couple times, but it will jump that straight to the center. When that little dot is appears in the center of your autofocus box, that means you're right in the very center of the screen. Okay, let's look at the three back buttons here. So the AF on button really does nothing. If you push it, it does the exact same thing that half pressing the shutter button does. It meters and then it engages the autofocus system, whichever one of the boxes is called up as default. It, lock, it engages that, the box locks on, and that's what it does. To take a picture, you have to push the shutter button. So we can do the same thing with the AF on button, but you can't do anything else with it. You can still hold it down if you want and take a picture like that. Then you're double calling up the metering and double calling up the autofocus system, which isn't going to hurt anything. But this is ripe to set up. It's all ready to set up. And when we get to button modifications, it's so easy to set up. It's just ready to go. We'll show you how to do that when the time comes. We have the star button right here. That's called the AE lock button. Can we just call it the star button? It looks like a star. So if you hold this down, what it does is it reprograms the main dial to adjust aperture. See, the, and that AKA F number, right? See how the F number is changing? That's the aperture. Remember when the F number gets bigger, 
the aperture gets smaller. It's kind of weird, right, how that works. But yeah, so you hold, you have to hold it down and you can change aperture there. Ultimately, this is where I have mine set up right now. But there it is. Last but not least of these three back buttons, we have this. It looks like a checkerboard. The official name is the autofocus point select button. Too many words, right? Let's just call it the checkerboard button. What does this one do? If I push that, you can see it tells you what it does. A new menu comes up. This does not time out, so we can take our time, and it tells you. So this language says the MFN button, our friend up at the front, the MFN button is now reassigned to adjust the autofocus boxes or the autofocus points. Let's see if that's true. Push the MFN button, and oh look, a nice little menu comes up which is time sensitive now, but there's, let's push it again. There are the eight autofocus points that we're gonna talk all about in the autofocus section. And we have three very cool adjustable zones here, which we don't have on the R5 or the R6, which is actually quite annoying that we don't have them. I love these things. You can customize these, these autofocus zones to the exact size you need for whatever type of bird or situation you're in. So very cool. Let's see what else the checkerboard button does. So the info button is reassigned to become a magnification glass. So there's the info button. If you hit that, now your camera is zoomed in like crazy and you can take the joystick and you can look around. It's like having binoculars. You can use the cross key pad here too and use the up cross key or the down cross key, the left or the right and manipulate them like that. If you push the set button in the middle, it gets you out of that mode. Okay, so that was the checkerboard button. Now, let's finish things off. The info button, if you hit that, it toggles between different types of information that can be on the viewfinder or on the LCD screen here. And so this one is very handy. This one has a histogram which is super important on a really bright day when the screen is not working so good. This isn't the greatest quality screen. It's not as bright or it's not quite as accurate as the one on the R5. So it's nice to have a little help up here and you can see what happens. And there's plenty of videos on these histograms. So you can read up on those, but if you're overexposed, you can see how everything stacks up to the right. If you're underexposed, everything is pushed to the left. So I encourage you to watch a video on that to learn more about that. So once you're in an area and you're set up, you can just turn that off and you can play with that however you want. Uh, we talked about this cross key pad. It really does nothing um, except if you are in the menu, then you can use this to toggle between the menu settings. Now, when you modify things, they, these buttons, these cross key buttons are modifiable. Some people set this one on the top up to toggle between the different autofocus points. You can do whatever you want. They are modifiable. But again, I keep my hand in an ergonomic position and there's no way I can hit that button. So I just leave that alone. Last but not least, we have the playhead button. If you push that in, it brings up the last picture that you've taken, and it also does something else. It turns this checkerboard button into a magnifying glass. There's a little blue magnifying glass. I don't think you can see that, but there's a blue magnifying glass right there, and that reminds you that when you're looking at a picture, if you hit the checkerboard button, it blows it up. And now another modification has occurred. Now we have the half cog there. That's the main dial. And it says the main dial is now controlling the magnification. So if we turn the main dial, we can blow this thing up. And very, very handy. You can grab this and drag the eye here. You can also use the joystick to move it around. But you want to check. If the bird is far away, you want to check to make sure the eye is sharp. How do you know you're not on a stick sometimes? I use this all the time. So very cool. Hit the playhead button, brings up the picture. Hit the checkerboard button, magnifies it, and now hit the main dial to really zoom in. You can use the cross keys to manipulate it or the joystick to manipulate it, or you can drag your finger and make sure the eye is nice and sharp. All right, the next thing we can talk about is this trash can. So if I pull up that last image I took, I don't want it, I hit the trash can 
and it's out of here. You just erased it off the card. Let's take one more look at the screen because we can control the exposure triangle just by tapping on each one of the settings. So there's the shutter speed, so we can play around with that right there. I don't recommend this because I want your eye in the viewfinder all the time looking uh, for birds, but you can do it there. You can tap on the ISO and you can drag it around, or you can use the cross keys to do this, or you can use the joystick to do this. All right, and then of course there's the ISO. We could control that there as well. Get that back in better exposure. Great. Another thing you can do with this screen is you can put the autofocus box right on the target you want. Let's say we want to get the barn owl there. You can tap right on it and it jumps right on it. We can tap on the snowy owl and it's got the snowy owl. Tap on Mr. Bill and it's, it can't find Mr. Bill. We need a different autofocus. Oh, it did. It got Mr. Bill there. Let's see if it could hold it. Yep, it got Mr. Bill just fine. Um, so that's another use for it. But again, I, I prefer you not use this because I want your eye in the viewfinder. But nevertheless, there it is. And finally, if you want to enter the Q menu, there's a Q button right there. You can hit on that as well. If you want to get out of the Q menu, there's a little arrow right there. You can hit on that. Remember how else to get in the Q menu? Just hit the Q button. All right, I am a professor of clinical pathology at a graduate school level, so I have to give you a quiz, right? I just have to. So here we go. You ready for a quiz? Show me three places you can control the aperture. Go. Okay, I heard somebody say, well, aperture is the same as F number, so you could just tap on the screen, which I don't prefer, but yes, that's one way. And then you could drag or do whatever. Great. Where's another way? Stock out of the box. Good, the quick control dial. That controls aperture. And where's the third way? Great, it's the star button. Hold the star button down, and now the main dial will control aperture. Very good. Um, how about the autofocus box is out of place? How do you get that back to the center? Great, multi-controller. Joystick, press it straight in. Straight in. See what I mean how it doesn't work sometimes? It took me three times to do that. You're supposed to be able to push it straight in. There it goes. It snapped back. But this isn't the best kind of cheap here, Canon. Okay, how about three places to control ISO? All right, good. Somebody said, went back to the, the screen, the LCD screen. That's one way to control it. Great. How about another way to control it? The obvious, the ISO button. So that huge obnoxious screen comes up. Great. And the third way to control it. Ooh, that's a little harder. Good, somebody remembered the MFN button. If you hit the MFN button, now it's not, see how it got thrown off? So hit the MFN button and you have to take the quick control dial and get it back over here in ISO. And now the main dial will control your ISO. That's the third place. And I will show you how to get rid of all that other junk so that doesn't happen. All right, great. Before we get to the next section, let me mention this. So just so we're all on the same page, remember all of these mirrorless Canon cameras have no internal memory. So you rely on these things. So this is an SD card. So you have to have a good fast SD card. This one's 200 megabits per second. This one is not fast enough. It's okay, but it's not fast enough. I'll flash a picture of the one I'm using. It's a little more money but it works good. Why do you need a really fast SD card? And no, there's not a CF Express card slot, which is a bummer in this camera. It's just two SD card slots. Why do you need a fast one? Well, the buffer is a problem with this camera. It's really, really small and it fills up very fast. I'll demonstrate that when we go over the shutter modes, but it fills up fast. Therefore, we need a card that can write or suck up that information from the camera onto the card so it can keep shooting. So the write speed is important. You want to go with a 300 write speed or higher if you can find one. 300 is the highest I could find without going crazy with regard to cause. So, all right, I think we're ready to go to the next section. Let's go talk about the menu. All right, guys, let's talk about the menu system. So hit the menu button. Let's go in there. Uh, let's go to menu number one. You can tap here on your touch screen or you can use the info button to jump between these. 
Remember, these are the main menus, the numbers are the submenus, and then under each number, we have the actual menu items. So let's start with big camera number one. Again, I'm a professor, so I gotta, I gotta use a memory trick with you. Please remember this for me, big camera seven. Big camera seven. I'll say it, think about lucky seven, you're at Las Vegas and you want a big camera. All right, I'll just leave it at that. I like to, when my students, I like to plant little memory things like that. I don't tell them what it's about, but it kind of sticks in their mind, the important stuff that way. Big camera seven. Let's look at big camera one here. So image quality, let's go in here. I have a feeling if you have bought a $1,500 camera body, you know all about this stuff. Stock out of the box, it's set on huge JPEGs. Um, and they, they actually work pretty good but you can't control everything in Lightroom with this. Uh, the Canon will do the Lightroom work for you, and unfortunately that work is permanent. You can't undo it. I can still manipulate these in Lightroom, but not like I can manipulate a RAW or a Canon RAW file. I, For the first time ever, I accidentally went out shooting and I left this in large JPEG for the whole morning, all four hours, and the eagles I was shooting that day were very active. I was so upset with myself. Uh, but actually, I'll put some of those pictures up right now. They came out surprisingly well. I was shocked at how good they look. They're not as good as the images could have been in C-RAW or RAW, but I was pleasantly surprised by how good this stock out of the box 32 megabit JPEG is. So if you're at a family function and you just want to quickly upload these to the internet or social media, go down to an S2 here. That's only 3.8 megabytes. You can easily upload that and it still looks really good. The camera will do even more of the processing work for you. And yeah, but this is a birding video. So turn off JPEGs. You cannot shoot what well, you can, but you should not shoot both JPEGs and RAW at the same time. Your buffer will be really, really short, unusably short. So turn off JPEGs. All right, guys, if you're shooting birds for real, you want to go to C-RAW here. You do not want to shoot in RAW. That's too big of a file. It's almost twice as big as a C-RAW file. And there's no difference. Uh, even if you print it, I like to print stuff big. I don't see any difference between RAW and C-RAW. The only time I see a difference is if it's really early in the morning and I was way underexposed. Then I'll put it on RAW because I can recover and I can bring up some of the shadows a little bit better. So bottom line, turn off JPEG, turn on C-RAW. Great. All right, moving on. A dual pixel RAW, don't worry about it. Still image ratio, stock out of the box settings, 3.2. Don't have to worry about it. If I say don't have to worry about it, it's the stock settings are just fine. There's nothing that we need to talk about here. Let's go to the next one. Number three, nothing we need to talk about. Metering mode, so evaluative is fine. This doesn't matter for us because we're shooting in RAW. If you're letting the camera do all the work for you, which you, I, doubt, I doubt you're going to do if you have a $1,500 camera, uh, then this comes into play if you're letting the Canon shoot, uh, if you're shooting on automatic. Uh, evaluative means it take it looks at the entire viewfinder and it makes adjustments via that way. You can put it down here to spot and it'll only look in the center to make the adjustments. If you're shooting in full raw, it doesn't matter what this is on. So leave it stock default. Number four. White balance, auto white balance is fine. Um, sometimes I prefer to have the same though. Um, I tend to shoot a little colder than most people. I like to shoot at 48 uh, Kelvin value. Uh, most people I would say shoot at 52. I know some professionals go up to 6,000. It's all about warmth. I just like things a little colder and then I can adjust them in post just fine. If I'm shooting my family, my grandkids, uh, then auto is fine. And look at all these settings. See, we can see the effect that the settings have on the screen. So if you're going to make a JPEG, these will influence how your JPEG looks. So auto white balance is fine for most people. So I have three cameras going right now, and I want the white balance to be the same. So I have them all set to 4800 right now. So, But auto is fine. All right, color space, sRGB is fine. If, if you want a few more colors on the palette, 
you can go with Adobe RGB. This is what I always use. It seems to work well with Adobe Lightroom Classic. Picture Style Auto, again, that's for JPEGs. I go down here to Neutral, though. All right, nothing else we need to do here. Let's go to number five. What Pop quiz, what did I tell you to remember? What is that thing? Good, so a lot of you remembered. Big Camera 7, Lucky 7. Vegas, you won a camera. Big Camera 7, we're coming there. So Big Camera 5, nothing to worry about. Big Camera 6, nothing to worry about. So this burst raw is heavily advertised that you can half press the shutter and it's silently taking pictures even though you're not taking pictures. If you're watching a bird and it jumps off a tree stump and you're just a little bit slow on the trigger, it'll it'll have those images for you, but it's a pain to get them out. They're not put on the SD card. You have to use the Canon software, which I hate. It's super slow. It's like from the 1990s software. It's just terrible. And then if you use this mode, you'll only be able to take about a half a second or maybe one second of shooting because the buffer's filled up. So it makes a small buffer even smaller. So I don't like it. I leave it off. Focus bracketing. Don't have to worry about it. Hey, here we are. Big camera seven. Let's go. What's the big deal with big camera seven? So big camera seven has the mode brothers that live here. We have the drive mode and we have the shutter mode. So major players. The drive mode, you can actually find that on the Q menu. If you scroll down in the left-hand column, you can see drive mode right there. But unfortunately, the one you're going to be playing with is the shutter mode. And this is the only place you can find it. There's not a button set up for it that I've found in this camera. If you know of one, let me know. Uh, but this is the shutter mode. And there are three shutter modes. There's electronic, electronic first curtain, and mechanical, and we'll get into what those mean. But this is the only place you can find it, Big Camera 7. Now I'll show you how to set it up in the favorites so you don't have to remember that. Uh, but if you ever reset your camera, Big Camera 7. In the SR5, it is Big Camera 6. All right, let's talk about drive mode. So drive mode is simply the number of frames per second that you can shoot with the camera. It controls how fast your camera can fire or how many pictures are taken per one press of the shutter. Right now, if I push the shutter button down, it takes one picture. Why is that? That's because I'm in this one right here. I'm in just, and that's called single shot mode or single shooting mode. One press equals one picture. For birding, that is not where you're going to be. And I'm just hitting the Q button here. It's easier for me to get to that menu. I could have went right through here. See, either way. For birding, you're going to be in the fastest mode. That's called High Speed Continuous Plus or H Plus. Or the second fastest mode, which is just confusingly called High Speed Continuous or the H menu. So let's look at High Speed Continuous Plus. So if we go into that mode and I push the shutter and hold it down, it's taking 15 frames per second. If we're in, I forget where we are, if we're in, well, let's see what, what shutter mode we're in. We're in electronic first curtain, my favorite. So 15 frames per second is what's being taken here. Um, let's actually go through these. The electronic shutter mode, you'll get 30 frames per second. The electronic first curtain or the mechanical shutter mode, you will get only 15 frames per second. And I shouldn't say only, that's plenty fast. You can get birds really well in flight with that. 30 frames is nice. You can get more wing position. So I tend to like to shoot in that, even though there's some problems with it. Um, but that's the story. So electronic, you get 30 frames per second. And electronic first curtain, or mechanical, you get 15 frames per second. If we move to this one, this is called high speed continuous. And if we push on that one, significantly slower. So for electronic first curtain, that's eight frames per second. That's what we're on now. For mechanical, it drops down to 6.5 frames per second. So that's really too slow, I think, for bird photography. So that's the story with the drive mode. It just controls how many pictures you can take per second. 
Simple as that. If you go down to low speed continuous, I don't know why you would use that so low. Three frames per second. Too slow for anything. All right, why do you want to shoot so many pictures per second? Well, the bird maybe will wink at you. It'll yawn. It'll fluff its feathers in a certain way. You don't want to miss little gestures like that. And if you're not shooting at least 15 frames per second, you can easily miss cool stuff. The bird winks at you. Um, so you can always get rid of the ones you don't want. And one more thing about drive mode. This has nothing to do with the shutter speed. Nothing to do with this button right here. Right? There's shutter speed right there. Shutter speed controls the amount of light that is allowed to hit the sensor to make the picture. That's what shutter speed does. It's a controller of the amount of light that hits the sensor. You can make a little bit of light hit the sensor or a lot of light hit the sensor. And it depends on the conditions out there. The drive mode has nothing to do with that. It's just shots per second, period, end of story. Now let's look at the shutter mode. So these shutter modes are three different ways to accomplish the settings that were made by the shutter speed. So if we, real easy example, so if you, if you set the shutter speed for one second, there's three different ways to let one second worth of light hit the sensor. Okay, so let's look at these different ways to let light hit the sensor. Mechanical. That one has been around forever. And this uses a front curtain and a back curtain to control the amount of light that hits the sensor. So let's use this analogy. My glasses are the sensor. So to make a picture, we want one second of light to hit these glasses, and then we'll have a beautiful, perfect, perfectly exposed picture. So how do we do this? Now, it's a little tricky because this is an electronic viewfinder, and we are seeing light in the sensor right now. The sensor is operating. So we, if we want to take a picture, we need to blacken it for a second. And so what happens when we push the shutter button in mechanical shutter mode is the first curtain comes down and blackens the shutter. The computer says, hey, it's black. We're starting the picture. So the computer starts the picture as soon as the first curtain slams down. Then the curtain will raise up and expose the sensor to light, making the picture. Great. And then to end the exposure, the back curtain or the second curtain will come up and blacken the sensor once again. So we allowed one second worth of light to hit my glasses by this method. Push the button, start the photo, lights exposed, in the photo. Simple as that. But there's some problems with mechanical shutter. Problem number one, when you press the button, you have to drop the front curtain down. That takes time, so we have a shutter delay. There's a lag and there's a delay that's occurred and that's noticeable. When you're shooting birds in flight coming into a nest, you have to take that into account. I did that just yesterday. I accidentally had it on mechanical when I wanted it on electronic first curtain and I looked at the images, I'm like, why are these so late? I'm missing the beautiful part where he's got his talons up, he's about ready to land on the nest and that's because I made that mistake. So there's a shutter delay because of that first curtain. Another problem is, so the first curtain comes down, it flies up and it bangs into the stopping mechanism and that causes a vibration of everything while the exposure is still going. Right, I still have light hitting my glasses when this one, and that really banged the back camera, when this bangs up, that really imparts a vibration. So if you're at really low speeds, the image quality and the image sharpness can be decreased because of that, that banging up of the first curtain. And that's called shutter shock. So that is a problem. And those are the only problems with the mechanical shutter. So what's the solution? Well, you could go into the next one and let's talk about that. Let's go to electronic shutter mode and see what that's about. All right, let's talk about the electronic shutter mode now. So electronic, your first curtain and your second curtain are in this open position and they don't move. You don't use the curtains in this shutter mode, which is cool. So there's no 
there's no lag. When you push the shutter button down to start the pitcher, the pitcher's already going. The computer just goes, oh, okay, let's start the pitcher immediately. So there's no lag at all. Pitcher starts instantaneously. But here's the problem. After the one second is over, we need to stop the exposure. So how do you stop the exposure? Well, you have to electronically turn off the sensor. And that's a problem. We don't have the technology to turn off the entire sensor in one shot. You have to turn the sensor off from top to bottom, line one off, line two off, line three off, line four, line five, and you just, it's like a curtain of darkness falling. And if you have an older sensor with older technology, which is in here, this is old technology, the sensor is really slow. So the curtain that shuts it off causes some weird effects with fast moving birds or objects. That's called rolling shutter. So the tips of wings can be bent in weird shapes. If you're panning across following a bird and there's a bunch of straight poles or trees in the background, they'll be bent to the side. So that's rolling shutter. Another problem is called banding. This is more of a problem inside. Some lights, like the fluorescent lights in a volleyball, if you're at a volleyball game or a basketball game, some of the lights in the in these gymnasiums, they pulsate. We can't see them, our eyes adjust for it, but there, this pulsation can cause weird streaks and color changes and weirdness in the images. Some of the images will be lost. So problem with electronic shutter. There's no problem with shutter shock. There's no problem with shutter delay, but there is a problem with rolling shutter and there's a problem with banding. So what's the fix? The fix is this, my favorite mode, this is electronic first curtain. So what does that do? Well, it takes to start the image, you start the image electronically. So the first curtain is an electronic curtain. So this is how we start. And you push the shutter button and the computer goes start. It marks start. The sensor is already being exposed, so there's no lag at all. To end the exposure, the back curtain or the second curtain just comes up and ends the exposure. Sure, it bangs into the stopping mechanism, but the exposure is completed as it bangs and causes a shutter shock, so there's no shutter shock. So very cool. So there's no shutter shock, there's no shutter lag, and there's no rolling shutter, and there's no banding. That's a no-brainer. What's the problem with electronic first curtain then? Well, here's the problem. Let's set it up and show you what the, it's already set up. Let's put the drive mode and you want to shoot this one in high speed continuous plus so you get 15 frames per second. And here's the problem. It's loud, right? It's not quite as loud as is the mechanical shutter, which is has two curtains slamming up and down. It's got only the second curtain slamming up, but it's loud. That'll scare birds away. And sometimes you just can't use it. Um, so you're stuck using the electronic shutter in silent mode or in a very low fake shutter noise sound, which I'll show you in a minute. So bottom line, what are my recommendations? Always shoot an electronic first curtain. If you can shoot high speed continuous, that's, let's go look at that. That's the H plus mode. So you're at 15 frames per second. If you have to shoot silent, then you can play around with the electronic shutter mode. If you're in electronic shutter mode, which we're in now, uh, and you see the warning, fast moving subjects may look distorted. It, it even warns you about rolling shutter. Uh, but if you're gonna shoot in electronic, then the drive mode should be high speed continuous. That's 15 frames per second. That's a fake shutter noise. That's plenty. All right, I still use electronic. Uh, in High Speed Continuous Plus, and I don't have to throw out that many images. Um, it's like hummingbirds, you couldn't use it with hummingbirds when wings are going really fast. Swallows, you can't use it with swallows, but slower moving large birds, it works okay for takeoff and landing. So let's have a listen to what that sounds like. Uh, we're in High Speed Continuous Plus. Where does it live? Where do these shutter modes live? All together, Big Camera 7, Big Camera 7, we're on electronic, listen to what it sounds like. That's 30 frames per second. That is amazing. But now, what are the drawbacks? Well, you can see one of the drawbacks. The buffer is full. 
Um, and that's one of the drawbacks. You hit the buffer pretty darn fast. So let's actually, we let it recharge for a second. So let's see how long we can shoot in high speed continuous plus electronic shutter mode, 30 frames per second. Ready, we've let it rest, the red light's off, the buffer has cleared, dumped everything on my SD card. Ready, set, go. That's not bad, right? It's usable. It's not the buffer's not that big of a problem as long as you're, you know, don't expect unrealistic things of it. All right, we have some more work to do here in Big Camera 7. So this is a pain in our butts here. Release shutter without card. Why would you want to take pictures without a card in here? You can go out and I've done this. I've went out birdie and I forgot to put a card in. And this is stock out of the box setting here. And you can take pictures. It sounds like you're taking a picture. You are taking a picture, but there's not a card to write the information to. So you've lost the pictures. So Canon, for the millionth time, I've sent them emails. Please turn this off. Right? Now we can't. It won't take a picture if there's not a card in here. What else we got here? So now there's a silent shutter function. If you suddenly need to make your camera quiet, you can do that immediately by turning on this function. But notice, now it's completely quiet, but notice what it does. It locks you into electronic shutter mode. So that's the only rub with that. And what about drive mode speed? Can you go down to high speed continuous plus? Yes, you can. So it doesn't affect that. You can shoot in high speed continuous or high speed continuous plus 30 frames per second or 15 frames per second. It just makes uh, you quiet and you can't use electronic first curtain with that on. But sometimes it's, a, it's on big camera seven. You've already memorized that. So the situation may arise when you want to make it silent. Um, and so, yeah, that's the story there. Just to prove it, I was in electronic shutter mode anyway. Let's go to our favorite electronic first curtain. And great. So there we are in high speed continuous, eight frames per second. Um, now let's go into silent shutter just to show you what happens. See, it just jumps right into electronic. And we're at 15 frames per second there. All right, that's the story with that. Let's go to big camera. Now, big camera eight and nine are all about the viewfinder here. So we're going to try to fix that little lag, that stutter that occurs when you're trying to pan with a bird in flight. The way this is set up stock out of the box, you'll get that stuttering effect. It's very hard to stay locked onto the bird. So let's try to fix that. If we go to big camera eight, there's a high speed display. To set it, we can't be in electronic, so we need to go back to seven. We are in silent shutter function that automatically puts you in electronic. We can't be there. We have to be in electronic first curtain or mechanical uh, to set it. Now, if we go back and look, we can set it for these slower speeds, but you're not gonna be shooting birds at high speed continuous anyway. So anyway, that's the story with that. This auto level used to be a problem. Make sure this is always disabled. If you enable that by mistake, you'll your viewfinder will be messed up and you'll get some weird warpy looking birds. So by default, it's disabled. But if you go out landscaping with it and you play with it, don't forget to set that back to disable. Number nine is the most important setting for us. So display performance, you want to set it to smooth. Great, and now it'll mitigate some of those black stuttery frames. Great, what else we got? That's it for here. Display simulation, if we go up here. I told you at the beginning, I'll show you how to make this viewfinder be more accurate without pushing the DOF button. It's right here, one setting. If I go to exposure plus depth of field DOF, and now the viewfinder won't lie to me. It'll show me the true depth of field. I won't explain that again because we already talked about that. Uh, number 10, nothing to worry about here. This is all movie stuff. Great. Let's move on to the autofocus menu. All right, guys, autofocus menu, really important here. So I said at the beginning, you'll send this camera back if you try to go out shooting birds stock out of the box. And it's because of these two settings. The very first one, autofocus number one, we have AF operation. It's set to one shot. What does that mean? That means if you lock onto a bird and you half press and hold down the shutter button halfway, 
It'll focus one time and that's it. If you're waiting for the bird to yawn or do something, you're just sitting there half pressing this. If the bird moves back, it will not refocus. If the bird shifts, it will not refocus. The good thing about this, if the bird is a statue or not moving at all, like an owl sometimes, I can move the owl in the frame and take a picture and it'll still be in perfect focus. If I were to do this in servo, if I moved off the bird, it would focus on the background. So the bottom line is live birds are moving all the time. So you have to keep constantly refocusing when you're half pressing that button. So you always want to be in servo. They used to call this AI servo in the older cameras. All right, next is the autofocus area. These are the autofocus points. We'll talk about those more later. Uh, no, we can do a pop quiz. How about that? Show me three places where you can toggle between the eight different autofocus points. Go. Well, yeah, we just did that one. If you go to the menu, autofocus number one, second menu item down, you can toggle between them here. There's spot focus, and it's changed to spot focus. Where else? Good, somebody remembered the Q button. We can hit the Q button here, or we can hit it here. And then if you go up to the top left-hand column, there's the autofocus point menu, and now there's the eight different autofocus points, and you can toggle between them. Uh, let's go to single point with helpers around it. And there you can see that the autofocus point has changed. This one's a little harder. Does anybody remember where the third one is? Great, checkerboard button. Hit the checkerboard button. Hit the MFN button, remember? MFN button now toggles between the autofocus points. So hit the MFN button, and now the main dial will toggle between the different autofocus points. We'll go to a single point. Cool. All right, so let's go back, continue our journey. Subject tracking is a monster. For right now, it's on. Let's turn it off for right now so I can show you how the autofocus points work. If you turn this on, the autofocus points are going to be manipulated by this and overrun by this thing. It's so powerful. Now, this is the other big setting. So AF operation to servo, this is the other setting where you'll send this thing back for bird photography. It'll do terrible. That's because subject to detect is on people. Birds are not people. Birds are animals, so you have to set it on animal. On people, your keeper rate will be 10%, 15% of the pictures you take will be decent. On animals, it's more like 75%, 80%. So you got to be on animals. Animals, what's an animal? According to Rudy Winston, who's the Canon technical advisor for the last 25 years, the computer scientists set this up to say an animal is a cat, dog, or a bird. So it's set up to look for fur, for eyes of cats, dogs, or birds, or feathers. So it's really important that you keep this to animals. Eye detection, you can leave on for now. We'll talk about that under the autofocus section. Switching track subjects, leave it to one, we'll come back to that one. Number two, cases, leave it to auto, we'll come back to this one in the autofocus menu discussion. Uh, autofocus number three, want to turn off this little firing beam, so a laser beam shoots out of this thing. It's not a laser, but it's a red focused beam when it gets really dark. It can disturb the birds. It doesn't work. It makes no difference. So turn that thing off. Great. Let's go to number four. Really nothing much we need to talk about here. Just real quick, this orientation linked autofocus point. Terrible description of what this does. If you, it's same for vertical and horizontal. So your autofocus point will be right in the center when you start. If you flip the camera to a portrait mode, it'll still be in the center and you're going to have to raise it up with the multi-controller or the joystick. Kind of a pain. If you make this setting, then it'll be in the center when you're in landscape mode. When you go to portrait mode, it'll jump up to the top third. Very, very handy. So that's a cool setting to make. Nothing else we need to talk about. Uh, limit autofocus areas, we'll come back to that one. Number five, so this is peaking. So 
if you go out early in the morning and the autofocus system isn't working, or if you're late at night, you're looking for owls and the sun's gone down, it's getting really dark, your autofocus system won't work. So you're going to have to use the focus ring here and manually focus. And you won't be able to do that stock out of the box because all of these are turned off. So let's turn on peaking. Show you how this works in a second. All right, let's also go down to focus guide here and turn that on. We'll see what all this stuff does now. So let's go to your lens. If your lens has it, turn uh, toggle the switch from autofocus to manual, and you'll get that. If you don't have that switch, then go to the DOF button, and there's a switch right there that you can use. Okay, great. And let me get rid of hit the info button and get rid of the stuff. So if we want to get the eagle back there, this still works. We still have a focus box, but now we have to do it ourselves. So there's a little focus wheel on your lens, and you just turn it until two things happen. So those sticks will come together, and the bird's eyes will turn red, and face and fur will turn red. So that's kind of a double way. See how the, see how the eagle's eyes are red now? Very cool. Take the picture. Got a nice sharp picture. We can display it. Blow it up. How do you blow it up? Checkerboard button's been reassigned. Then we can use the joystick to move it in. And we can use the main dial to blow it up. That's pretty darn sharp, wouldn't you say? All right. So that's the story with that. Let's set it back to auto. All right, number six, nothing much in here we need to talk about. No. All right, let's go to the next menu. So this is the playhead menu. There's nothing in here we need to worry about except on number six. We can go through here just so you can see what they are. You can play with these. For birding, don't have to worry about any of these things. This one we do, though. This is, I should have done this right off the bat. I use this all the time. So autofocus point display this will show where the focus box actually was located when you took the picture. Was it on target or was it on a stick? So very, very cool. So let's enable this and take a picture and see. So I shot the snowy owl and it's still automatically pulling up a photo for me. We haven't come to that yet. Uh, but if I hit the playhead button, we were right on target. So this is very handy. Very cool. I leave that on all the time. All right, nothing else there. Let's go to the Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, airplane mode, all this stuff. I'm not going to worry about that. The wrench, there's not too much in the wrench we need to worry about. I'll just scroll through here. Uh, the beep, let's talk about the beeps. So you can control the fake shutter sound that is on the electronic shutter mode. Remember from the R5 and R6, it's completely silent. Some people, including me, didn't like that. It's hard to judge when you're going to hit the buffer if you can't hear the shutter sound. So with beep enabled, which it is by default, you can go to volume and you can check it out. So sh fake shutter sound or fake shutter volume, that should say. If we go into that, Set it to 1. That's plenty loud. You won't disturb anybody, but you can, if you're in electronic shutter mode, it'll make a noise so you can judge a buffer. All these other things, you can turn these off. We don't need any sound here on any of these. There's the selfie, what we're not going to talk about. Turn all those off. Great. Okay, headphones, power savings. We did this, or I did this at the beginning. So go into power savings. I strongly recommend you disable all of these. This is set to like 10 seconds or 15 seconds. You don't want this thing to be asleep when the bird of your life appears and you have two seconds to take the shot. It'll take two seconds for this camera to wake up. So disable all of these autofocus features. I've already done it for you. This was set to one minute. Just go to disable. Simple as that. All right, number four. Sometimes the screen could be a little brighter if it's really sunny out. So you can bump that up to five, What is what I usually do. I'll leave it the same right now for my settings. Same with the viewfinder. It's not the greatest, the biggest viewfinder in the world. So if it's really bright outside, light can sneak in. So 
auto, I mean, it's okay, but I tend to go up to four and I leave it set on four. So those are some modifications for that part of the wrench and nothing else we need to worry about here. Reset the camera. We already did that factory reset. There's your copyright information. There's your firmware. By the way, I am using the latest firmware 1.3.0. So last but not least, we have the little camera. Not a whole bunch we need to mess with here. There's number one. Number two is right here. Okay, real quick, this one's kind of important. So same exposure for new aperture. I like to set this for ISO and shutter speed. And what this does is if you're shooting the 100 to 400 or the 100 to 500 and you're maxed out at 500 and the bird is too big and you back it off to 400 millimeters of focal length, you've just messed up your ISO and your shutter speed. You've messed up your exposure triangle. This will automatically correct it for you. It's wonderful. You're not going to have time to do that on the fly, so I strongly recommend you set that one. Just beware. Sometimes it doesn't work. When you first turn on the camera, this won't work, and you have to adjust the ISO and the shutter speed manually one time, and then it will tend to work. All right, that's the story with that. So number three, we're going to come to customize buttons again and again, customize dial, but not right now. Number four, there's nothing. Five, there's nothing. We already used that setting. Great. That brings us to the personal star menu. I recommend that you set the shutter mode right here in case you forget Big Camera 7. Remember, that was the only place we can find it. It's really easy. Just hit the set button, go OK, go configure, select items to register. There's all the settings in this camera. Let's go way down here and find shutter mode, drive mode is there. You can put that there too if you want. Shutter mode. Click OK, OK, and you are done. If we go back to the beginning, hit the menu, and look in the star button, there is the shutter mode settings again. So that's pretty cool. Great. In the next section, we're going to go over the autofocus system. Very important section. Off we go. All right, guys, we're at the autofocus part of this video. We're going to learn about the autofocus points, subject tracking. I'll fly through this really fast. I have a feeling some of you have just jumped right here. And we still need to do a little work here anyway. So the autofocus menu, under the menu settings, number one, we've already changed these. So AF operation, always servo, never one shot. You need to make that change. Autofocus area. These are the autofocus points we're going to be talking about here in a second. So we know three ways to change these already. We'll talk more about them. Subject tracking. I had you turn that off for right now. This is a monster. It will overrun the autofocus points. And I want to show you how they work without the subject tracking overrunning them. Then we'll turn on subject tracking. Make sure you're set to animals and not people. Stock out of the box settings is people, so make sure you're on animals or you'll send this camera back. Keeper rate will be about 15%. We can leave eye detection on. I'm going to set up a button where we can toggle that on and off. It doesn't make a huge difference. Now, we didn't talk about this one, so switching track subjects. This is the stickiness of the autofocus point. So let's pull up an autofocus point here. This is a good one, this one-point autofocus box. So how sticky do you want this to be? If the snowy owl takes off and starts flying, do you want to stick on the snowy owl if it goes behind a tree? Or another bird comes in front of it and blocks our view for a second? Of course you do. So you want to make this as sticky as possible, but you don't want it so sticky that maybe you start off on a stick and the bird starts flying and you can't get off the stick because it's too sticky. So it's kind of a delicate line here. But after 60,000 pictures with this camera, here's what I have found. Switching tracked subjects set that to zero. It makes it sticky. One degree of stickiness, I call it. We can add two or even three more degrees of stickiness if we want. But for right now, set that to zero. Let's go to autofocus submenu two, cases. Bottom line, leave it to auto. Just like the R5, I've experimented and experimented and auto works best for birds in flight. 
but let me explain this anyway. So we have four different cases set up here. And all these cases are, are different permutations of two settings, tracking sensitivity and acceleration, deacceleration tracking. So case one, they're both set to zero. So this one really doesn't do anything. Case number two, now we have tracking sensitivity set one to the left, negative one. This makes it even more sticky. So now we have two degrees of stickiness, you could say. We have one degree of stickiness we set here, switching track subjects. And now if you go to case two, there's another degree of stickiness. And this does work pretty good some of the times. Okay, definitely one to try out for birding. Number three is no stick. So we've lost a degree of stickiness. So tracking sensitivity has went to plus one. It basically just negated switching tracked subjects. So you're back to you're back to kind of a neutral setting for this one. But there's a new setting that is tweaked. Acceleration deacceleration tracking is now set to plus one. So what is acceleration deacceleration tracking? That is giving the Canon autofocus system a warning as to how erratic the subject that you're locked onto, how crazy is that movement going to be? Perfect example is a cheetah that is chasing a gazelle. The movement is going to be who knows where it's going to be. It's going to be into the plane of the page, away from the camera. It's going to be toward the camera, to the left, cutting back to the right, or like a, like a running back running through uh, running in football down the field and avoiding tacklers. Unpredictable movement. Therefore, you want to give the Canon autofocus system a warning that things are going to be crazy, and that's what case three does. We don't use that for birding. Case number four, it just is the cheetah example again. This makes more sense for a cheetah because it's sticky. If I was really shooting a cheetah chasing a gazelle, I would turn that tracking sensitivity down to negative one to make it really sticky on the cheetah, if that's what I wanted. You are able to go in and tweak these menu settings to your heart's desire. So if we're gonna, if we're going to try to set this up for a cheetah, it's probably better to turn tracking sensitivity down. So for me, it looks like I have to hit the checkerboard button. And then if I hit the set button, there's sensitivity so we can move it one over. You could even go way over if you want. That'll really make it. That's three degrees of stickiness. So yeah, that if I was if I was going to shoot a cheetah, I would definitely play around with that right there. So you can go in there and modify these as you want. All right, just a little more explanation. Now, if you wanted to, let's set this one up for a bird that suddenly appears and you want to jump on it really quick. Let's say you expect an eagle to fly back to the nest and you have your autofocus point on the nest. So you want to immediately get off the nest and get onto the bird that's coming in. So you might want to take some of that stickiness off for this situation. So we can go in and do that. We can manipulate the tracking sensitivity right here by going to the checkerboard button, hitting set, and let's let's make it more responsive, more jumpy. We can make it really jumpy, and that way it'll jump off the nest and onto the bird really fast. And you can play around with this setting if you want. And sometimes I do use this if I'm on the nest in this situation. A lot of times I like to grab the bird when he's getting closer to the nest, and I don't fire pictures, but I just lock on to him, and then I hang on to him as he goes through the really tough tree background, and then I start firing when he gets close to the nest. That's the way I usually do it. But this way you could jump on the eagle uh, quite quickly. So that's just some examples, and I mean, play with these and see what works. All right, let's move on. Number three, nothing. We turned off the assist beam here. There's nothing we need to talk about. Uh, preview autofocus, that should always be disabled. I think I said that before. 
We're going to come back to this limit autofocus area, so I'll put that right there. Nothing you need to worry about. We've already talked about it. We turned on peaking and, and focus guide already. Number six, there's nothing we need to worry about here. All right, let's talk about these autofocus points now. Pop quiz, where do the autofocus points live? I know I did this in the last section, so those of you who are still hanging with me, you should be able to rattle these off. I want to I want to change the default autofocus point. Where do I go to do that? Good. Somebody said hit the Q button. Let's hit the Q button. And there they are. Remember, though, you have to be up here on the AF icon in the top left-hand corner. And then you can toggle between all eight of them right here. And let's explain these in a second. Where is the, so we're still on the pop quiz. Where's the second way to find these? All right, somebody said menu. So go to the menu. If you go to AF number one, they're right down there, autofocus area. You have to double hit here. I think that's some weirdness because I have the screen recorder on. You'll jump right to it with the screen without a screen recorder. And there they are again. Same ones. They don't time out here. You're not going to set them here. It's too slow to get in here. Third way. This is the tough way for you A students. Great. Go to the checkerboard button. Go And the checkerboard button tells you right down there. MFN is now converted to AF point toggling is kind of what that says. So hit the MFN button. And now the main dial can toggle between the different autofocus points. Great. All right, let's look at them now. Let's just use the Q menu. Let's introduce these to you if you don't already know. This is the workhorse here. This is called Spot Autofocus. Spot Autofocus. They're focus boxes. These are all focus boxes. This is the tiniest of all the focus boxes. There it is. It's a little bitty thing. Very good for birds uh, that are of this size and you want to get right on their eye. How do I snap the autofocus box back to the center? You guys can tap on the screen, but you might not hit the dead center. How do you do that? Push this multi-controller, this joystick, push it straight in. And there it snaps back after two tries. I said this is kind of a cheap button. It's got a cheap plasticky feel, and it's not super sensitive, but it works. All right, there we go. So if I want to get a picture of Mr. Bill, we just shoot Mr. Bill. And there he is, displayed, displayed for two seconds. Where do I, I want this to display for four seconds because I can't hit my playhead button or the ninja will go off. I don't think I told you that one. So let's go back into the menu and go to big camera, not seven, but big camera eight, I think it was. There's image review. I forgot to tell you this, so this is a bonus if you're still with me. Image review. It's at two seconds. Let's bump it up to four seconds. Normally, you would want this off because it interferes with your next shot. But for this video, I'm just going to leave it on. All right, great. Now, when I take a shot of Mr. Bill, got Mr. Bill. It's locked on for four seconds. Cool. I know where I shot. So the Canon autofocus system is looking only inside the box. It's not looking outside the box at all as long as subject tracking is not turned on. Problems occur when we turn on subject tracking, as you'll see. So simple as that. Let's go to the next one. So this is, the, this is one point autofocus. It's the same thing, but it's a bigger box. Now Mr. Bill doesn't fit in there so good, but the snowy owl does. So we can take a picture of that, or maybe the bald eagle. Let's go take a picture of that one. It looks a little blurry now, but watch when I hit the half press the autofocus button snaps right into shape, got the picture, perfect, great. How do we blow that up? You remember that one? Oh, I better not do that because I'll knock out the screen. You just hit the checkerboard button, that magnifies it. Great, that's all that is. Again, the Canon will look inside the autofocus box for sharpness and detail and contrast. Now, according to Rudy Winston, it won't look for an eye, but at least on the R5, and I assume it will do the same here, it'll look for a face or a body of a bird or a cat or a dog. So it does look for that, but it mainly looks for contrast, sharpness, detail. It's looking for something that it can really lock onto. It does not look for an eye, and it's nothing like subject tracking, we'll see. But the key point is here, if you're in a crowded environment and this is the target, 
it will obey you. It will look inside this box. It will not go outside of this box. If we want a bigger box, we just go to a bigger box. Let's go to the next one and see what that's about. This is exactly the same size box, but now it has four helper points around the outside. So these are kind of cool. Um, in fact, this one, if you're going to use this one, let's just go to the next one because it's the same, only it's got more helper points. The official name for this is Expanded Autofocus Area Around. It's just a one-point autofocus box with helper points all the way around it. And here's the story with this. Let's say we're on the eagle, we're going to take a picture. And just as we push the shutter button down, the eagle shifts away. The Canon will still look, and this is happening really fast, the Canon will look inside the main focus box and it'll go, guys, I don't see any face, I don't see a head, I don't see sharpness or detail. Do any of you helper boxes see anything that we can lock onto? And the boxes at 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock, We'll say, you know what, I got, looks like feathers here. I got real contrasty, sharp looking structures. So the main box will say, okay, we're going with you. And the autofocus will just work by those three o'clock and four o'clock boxes. Even though the display autofocus point says you missed the target, a lot of times you hit the target. That doesn't always tell the truth, that thing. So this is very handy. I use this. Uh, for the eagles taken off out of the nest where the autofocus system can grab sticks and fake eyes. It doesn't work so good, but this works good. I can usually keep the eagle within the main box or at least within the helper box is pretty good. Let's go to the next one. Now these next ones are very cool. So these just used to be zone autofocus boxes, but now they're called flexible zone autofocus boxes and we can adjust the size of them. The way they were is, this is, and pop quiz, how do we get that back to the center again? Push the multi-controller straight in, a joystick, push it straight in. So this is the same one that's on the R5 and you can't adjust it. It's a good one, it's just a square, you can keep a bird in flight here. But if you're shooting the snowy owl and he zigs instead of zags and you go out here, you'll lock on the pole. It will not look outside the box because it's not looking for eyes. Supposedly it'll look, according to Rudy Winston, it looks for a face, a head, and a body. And so we can get a picture of the owl like that. And you can see it physically looking now. Uh, these are different than the spot autofocus and the one-point autofocus boxes where nothing is really physically looking. That's why I question Rudy Winston on that. I have a feeling for those spot autofocus and the single autofocus point box, I have a feeling it's just looking for contrast and sharpness and detail. But here it's actively looking for something. If we put it over for Mr. Bill, it's trying to find a face. It doesn't look for an eye, uh, apparently, but it looks for a face and body. It's really struggling with Mr. Bill. What would you do in a situation like this? Well, you would quickly have to switch autofocus points. You'd have to fly over here to the box and then drop that down. And now we got them no problem because it's it's you're telling it where to look. And now we got it no problem. So the trouble is the way this is set up, if you want to quickly switch between boxes, you got to push the Q menu and then hopefully it's on the AF icon and then you got to, it's too much time. I'll show you how to toggle it with one button really quickly in the next section. All right, so that's the zone. We'll modify the zones in the next section. The next zone is just like the R5. It's a vertical zone. Maybe for basketball, this would be good, but for birding, there's nothing. Maybe a great egret will fit in that box okay, but if we try to look for Mr. Bill here, I mean, it doesn't know what to do. Even if we look for snowy owl, well, snowy owl is okay, but if there's other things around, like if we go to the barn owl, see how it's grabbing the wing of the snowy owl? It's just not that accurate, so I would normally get rid of this, but we can modify it. And I'll show you that in the modification section. And if we go in again, the third adjustable is a more horizontally designed box. So you can move it around with a joystick if you want. You can move it around with a joystick. You can snap it back to the center by pushing the multi-controller straight in. Um, great. But the same problem. I mean, if we're trying to get pokey here, it's really struggling. I can see I have the dot lined up on pokey. I can 
suggest that it looks in the center by pushing the multi-controller straight in. If it behaves, if I push it straight in, sometimes it'll lock. All right, and then the very last one we can go to. This is an autofocus box, but it's the entire screen is the autofocus box. So this one is on the loose, looking for, again, it doesn't look for an eye uh, in the system, but it looks for a face. But if I want to get the barn owl, now this one's interesting. You can command it a little bit. If I push the joystick straight in, see how it snaps into the middle? I'm saying, hey, look for something in the middle. You're locked onto the wrong thing. Um, and there it's got our target finally. Unfortunately, it's way too slow. It's like they're still developing this technology, but just for the record. And then this pops up sometimes because it's looking in the whole box for a face. And when you see a double-headed arrow and that little, that little white box that's called a tracking box, it's also saying, hey, I see something to the left, a face to the left, and I see a face to the right. Maybe it's an eye, maybe it's the eagle. Let's go left. If you take the joystick and push it left, it jumps on the eagle. So pretty cool. Again, in the field, in the heat of the battle, it's kind of hard to make it do this, but it's good to know that you can do this. Let's go back to Pokey. Let's get up to the barn owl. The trouble is you can't manipulate that little focus box or that suggestion box. It's just stuck there. So it's not really usable, but it's interesting. Now let's go back to our spot focus. Let's repeat this and let's see what happens when we turn on the monster, the subject tracking. Here we go. All right, let's turn on subject tracking. Go to autofocus, subject tracking. Here we go. The monster is released. All right, now look what happens. So there's the tracking frame, it's called, or the tracking box. You see it? So I want to take a picture of Pokey. And I got it right on Pokey's eye. And the Canon subject tracking is hey, saying, it's suggesting to me, hey, I got a more sharp eye up here. There's the bald eagle. You sure you want to shoot Pokey? If I half press, what happens? I'm locking on Pokey, but it's like it doesn't want to lock onto Pokey. So I can still get Pokey if I'm lucky. Yep, I got Pokey. But yeah, this thing is very powerful. If I want to shoot the wing for whatever reason, I want to shoot the wing of the barn owl. Oh, forget it. Okay, I want to shoot right there. Normally, I would be able to shoot inside this box. The cannon wouldn't be looking outside the box. If I half press, look what happens. Locks right on the owl, so it completely disobeyed me. Now, I don't know if that's a problem. Is cannon working on that? But it's really annoying because uh, we basically lose our spot focus. If I want to take Mr. Bill here, let's see if that works. Sometimes it works. All right, we got Mr. Bill. It's not locking on his head, but we got Mr. Bill. So that worked fine. Um, if I want to take, this is a really hard one. What if I want to take the nose? Okay, it's going to work on that. So it doesn't always mess up. But it's, it's sometimes, as we saw, if I want to take a picture of the wing, forget it. Let's try the wing, and notice how the box is gray. When you see the box gray and not green, that means it's going gonna, it's gonna to diss you. It's going to go to something other than what you're aiming at. It's not going to pay any attention to you. And I think that's a problem that needs to be fixed with it. All right, and that happens in everything. If I want to take a picture right there of the neck, for whatever reason, I can't do it. It's going to grab the eye. So again, it's disobeying. And if I go to a bigger autofocus point, let's go to the one point. Same thing. I can't, I can't, well, I can get the owl, but you can't be specific. And maybe that's okay, because I mean, we should be not shooting the wing of the owl. We should be shooting the face. So maybe I'm not being fair to it. But if you get anywhere close, now I want to get the barn owl. Now I jumped on the eagle for a second, and now it's hanging out there. How about the snowy owl? Yeah, so most of the time it works okay. And for birds in flight, sometimes it's wonderful because you're, you're going up and down with the camera and you might go out of the box and that's fine. It'll go out of the box and keep tracking. That's why I leave it on. But because I leave it on, I've lost my spot focus and my single point focus boxes. 
I can't trust them. So I have to set up one of the back buttons, which we're going to do in a second. All right, and it does it no matter which one I go. Even if I go into the one with assist points, the same thing. If I set up, if I set up on the chest of this owl, it's going to say, F you, I'm going to the eye. So it works in all those. What about zone? What if I go into one of the zones? What will it do there? So if I'm in the zone, same thing. See how it's grayed out? That means that it's not listening to me. And this is really a problem. I want Mr. Bill. It's grabbing the owl. It was grabbing the pole a second ago. So again, it's it breaks the rules. It doesn't stay inside the box. Sometimes it does. And sometimes it's a blessing. It saves the picture. Let's get this. Let's get the barn owl. I can't get the barn owl. Maybe if I get up on his face. Now I got the barn owl, but it's a problem. All right, but I'll show you how to mitigate that. It's so darn good in a situation not like this where there's so many eyes. It's amazing when the background is clear and not cluttered. I mean, I had my ten-year-old grandson out with me shooting. And with subject tracking on, he was nailing birds, uh, getting shots right on the eye with that. Even if he went outside the focus box, he was getting them. So you got to leave it on, I think. I do. But the price is you lose your spot focus and you lose your single point autofocus boxes, all of them. And really, you lose everything. So what's the workaround? Let me show you in the next section where we go over button modifications. All right, guys, let's do some button modifications. The very first one I promise, for those of you who want to use the MFN button to toggle between the ISOs, I said it's too easy to bump this quick control dial and deselect ISO as the default for this. Now we're on servo, which is ridiculous. So I said that I would clear some of these out of here. Let's do that one right now. So go into the menu. And we're going to be doing the same route a lot. Let's go to the little camera and let's go to number three. And let's go to customize buttons. Now we have a little cartoon of a camera and we can scroll with the quick control dial. We can use the cross keys and the cross key pad. We can use the main. There's many ways to do this. But see how the on the cartoon camera, some of these buttons and dials are turning orange. You want to make sure that you're in the camera row and not this row. This is the movie camera row. You don't want, we're not making settings for that one right now. We're working on the camera. So let's go find the MFN button. There it is. Is that correct? No, we're in the movie camera row. We need to go over here. So let's go into this. Dial function is the, is the, is the icon that's called up. But there's an info detail button down there. See it? So if I hit the info button, you can tap on it. I can't. That means there's more stuff to adjust. Always look for those when you're playing around with this. So hit info. And look at all this junk that's in the menu. We don't need all this junk. We just want ISO. So let's turn off drive mode. Let's turn off one shot. Just uncheck it by pressing the Q button. Turn all this stuff off. Side note. Autofocus area can be changed here. So that's interesting. If you want to toggle between the autofocus points, uh, we can set it up there. So we don't have to hit the checkerboard and then the MFN button. We can just hit the MFN button. So you could set that up there as well. We're not doing that though. So hit info to go to next. Hit info for OK. Hit OK for set. And now when we go into the MFN button, the only thing there is ISO. So if I accidentally bump the quick control dial, it doesn't care. Great. So that's modification one. While we're here, let's set this up the way I like it set up. I like it to be set up where I just push the MFN button and it toggles between the autofocus points. Right? There's no, that's really, really fast. It's the fastest way possible. How do you do that? Let's go right back into it. Customize buttons. Let's go find it with a couple clicks. There it is. Let's go into that menu. So there's the one we want. And you can set this up anywhere you see it. You should memorize this. Take a picture of it with your iPhone. That's called Direct AF Area Selection. If I click OK, now watch what happens when I start clicking the MFN button.
see it toggling between the different autofocus systems. You can also see subject tracking messing around with them too, can't you? So right there, it's saying, F you, we're not going to use you. Let's fix that. Let's turn that subject tracking off right now by going to Menu. Remember where that subject tracking is? It's Autofocus 1 Subject Tracking. Let's turn this off because it's just such a wild beast. Turn it off. So now when I hit the MFN button, see how we toggle between the different autofocus points? Great. That's the button modification I use every day with this camera. All right, what can we do next? I promised you that I would show you how to modify these zones because this is useless. That one's pretty much useless. So let's modify these zone autofocuses. So this one you might want to write down. To modify this, you have to hit the checkerboard button, then the MFN button, select which zone you want to modify, and hit the checkerboard button again. I kid you not. So watch, let's modify one of these. Hit the checkerboard button, hit the MFN button, and now choose zone one, two, or three, whichever we want to modify. Let's do number one. Hit the MFN button again. And now two little controls have come up. There's that half cog. That means the main dial is going to do something. The main dial stretches this out. But let's make this really small. This is the way I usually set it up. And now the quick control dial is highlighted so we can control the vertical height like this. And let's actually move this a little tighter. And there's how I usually have this set up. Okay, how do we snap that back to the beginning? Hit the joystick, multi-controller. Now we got ourselves a nice little box. And as long as subject tracking isn't on, this thing will look inside the box for a face. It grabs Mr. Bill just fine, grabs Gumby, no problem. It can even grab Pokey, I bet. Yep, pretty good. So, very cool. Let's do it again. Let's modify the zone number two. Remember how to do it? Good. Checkerboard button. And remember the name of this? I call it the checkerboard button. This is the autofocus point select button. It's too long of a name. We're not going to use it. Checkerboard button. So checkerboard button, MFN button. Choose the zone you want to modify. This time we have to move over to zone two. And then quickly hit the MFN button again. And now we got our manipulators there. Let's go to the quick control dial. We're going to make a little bit bigger box this time. And let's go to the main dial. That's a perfect size box for me. Uh, click set and that's okay. And there's what you got. And we can modify that. I usually set it up a little bit. And for birds in flight, that's pretty good. I can usually keep the bird in there. If I turn on subject tracking now and the bird's flying, if the bird goes out of the box, the subject tracking will sometimes save the day. On the other side of the coin, it might grab onto a stick that's outside the perimeter of the box too. I tend to leave subject tracking off when there's a tough background. Should we do it for a third time or do you got it? Let's do it for a third time. You tell me how to do it. I'm listening. Great. Hit the checkerboard button, MFN button, select zone three, checkerboard button. Now we got it made. It's not going to time out now. We got all the time in the world. This is usable, but let's make it really big. So let's toggle this maybe. Yeah, that's fine. Let's toggle the quick control dial. How's that? Great. So we got a really big box for an erratic big flying bird. And great. So we're looking there. If we want even a bigger box, then we just go and look. We got this autofocus box, which is the entire screen is now the focus box. And so, yeah. So we really have just created four different zones where the autofocus will look for stuff. And again, if I want to get the snowy owl, see how it's stuck on the barn owl? I can push the joystick straight in and that tells it, hey, look in the center. And now it's looking in the center and it's got the nose of the snowy owl. It's That's a tracking box. If I take a picture, it's nailed it. If I half press, see the little arrows? That's telling me that, hey, I see something to the left and something to the right. If I go to the left, I push the joystick over to the left, nothing happens. If I push it to the right, there we go. Got Mr. Bill. That's a tough one, right? You see what I mean? This isn't perfect, though. If I want it to go back in the snowy owl, I push the joystick straight in. It's back in the center. If I want to go left, let's see if we can get it to go left. 
It went to the left eye. I want it to go to the bar now, but it's not. So it's still not perfect. And this is without subject tracking. Now let's turn on subject tracking with this full box mode, this full screen mode, and see what happens now. It becomes even more manageable. So now we're back in the snowy owl. Let's try to push left now. Now it's still not doing it. So let's go for Mr. Bill. See what I mean? It's kind of hit and miss with this thing. Uh, but trust me, in the open field with, with a non-complicated background, uh, this thing is amazing. Let's see if we can put it in the middle here. So, But remember the problem with this now. If we go into, oh, I can just toggle, right? Well, I'll do this so you can see. If we go to a single autofocus point box, remember now, it's like the Wild West. It's not going to obey you. If I want to get Gumby or Pokey, yeah, we got Pokey. But if I want to get the shoulder right there, now it's going to go wild. And it doesn't know what to do. It's looking everywhere. So I can see why a lot of full-time professionals turn off the subject tracking. But there is a time and place for it. Not in a crowded environment, though, usually. You'll have to play with it yourself and see. It's got Pokey's eye there. Okay, what about the barn owl? See the tracking box on the barn owl there? If I half press, nope, it didn't go up there. Tracking owls over. If I go close to that tracking box, it'll grab it. It's kind of like a hint, like, hey, and I'm not half pressing. Hey, I see something. Go up a little bit, and I'll grab you a barn owl. So that's the way that kind of works. Okay, what else can we modify? Uh, eye tracking. Let's put the eye tracking on the DOF button since we set that up so it's always on. So right now the DOF button doesn't really do anything. So that's real easy. Go into the menu. Let's go into big or little camera number four or number three, customize buttons, and let's go find that DOF button. There it is. Great. Let's set that up for eye tracking and see what that does now. So now I can toggle it on and off. If we leave it on, now let's see how this behaves. See, it's grabbing eyes like crazy. I have subject tracking on. It's just grabbing eyes wherever I go. Barn Owl. How about Mr. Bill? Can we get Mr. Bill? <laughs> see, it's freaking out. No, it wants. it's telling me I see an eye. I don't see Mr. Bill's eye. But if I drop the focus box on Mr. Bill, I'm sure it'll get... Nope, it still can't get Mr. Bill's eye. So it's not perfect. But it's really good at finding eyes. There's a nose... There's the eye. I just push the joystick in. So you can play with it, but it's really good for finding eyes. If I turn it off, watch this. So now it's off. It's got the face of the eagle. If I turn it on, it's got a little tiny box around the eagle's eye. It's going to be a very sharp shot. Off, on. Off, wax off, wax on. What was that? That was a movie, that uh, Karate Kid movie. Wax on. Wax off, wax on. So very sharp picture there. Look at that tiny little focus box. So good to leave that eye thing on. But again, it might grab sticks. And if it's not grabbing an eye on the bird you see and it's grabbing sticks, turn it off. All right, we got the autofocus box done. What else can we modify? So I don't like the ISO here on the quick control dial. It's just not for me. My thumb is right there. I'm constantly manipulating ISO. The R5, if you take that dial and flip it up horizontally, the R5, that's where a dial is to control the ISO. And to me, that's just where my muscle memory is. So I want that ISO. How do I do that? Really easy. Menu, customize dials, and let's just go look for it with one of the cross keys. There it is right there. Push the set button. There's the options. Look at there's an option to toggle between your autofocus. Let's see what that's all about. Let's set it up for that. Now if I scroll, see how it's toggling between the autofocus system. Subject tracking is messing things up. Let's get rid of that so I can teach you guys stuff without it interrupting everything. And I know there isn't there's a button where you can turn that off, but you have to hold it down and it doesn't work very good if you're wondering why I don't toggle that on. But anyway, so look at that. 
So now we can toggle between these boxes, just like that. So cool. But that's not what we wanted to do. Let's put the ISO there. So let's go back to little camera, customize dials, find it, go back in, change it to ISO. Great. Oops. Don't forget to hit the set button. Now we're okay. So now when I toggle this, you can see the ISO changing over there. Cool. And now you might be saying, well, what about the aperture? That was the aperture control. No, remember the star button. If I hold down the star button, I can change the aperture like this. I'm wide open anyway, right? This is APS-C camera. So my 100 to 500, the ISO, the F number went from 7.1 all the way to 11.3. And I don't want any more. I don't want to stop down any. So I hardly ever change it. All right, what else can we modify? I said I'd show you how to calm the quick menu down. So let's go find the quick menu. That's actually in Big Camera 8, I remember. So Big Camera, and let's go to number 8, Customize Quick Controls, Edit Layout, give it a second to think. There's all the junk that's on your quick control menu. We don't need all this junk, so let's get rid of it. I want autofocus there. One shot I don't want there. Just uncheck it. Drive mode I want there. Metering, I don't want it there. Maybe you do. Image quality, I don't want that there. To me, I don't need any of this junk. If I want this junk, I'll go into the main menu. Great. And there's even some other settings down here that you can look and play with. You could set these up there if you want, but that's I don't need any of this stuff there. All right, so follow the prompts on the way out. We'll come back and rearrange it in a second. So menu, exit, and now save and exit. Great. Now when I go in the queue menu, hey, there's only two things there. And there's that button to get out of the queue menu, the escape button we can't get out of there. But yeah, now the other thing I don't like, they're too far apart. How do we move them closer together? Let's go back into that again. Customize quick controls, edit layout. Give it a second to think. Now hit the info button. See info down there? Info will, will bring up a rearrange function. So let's push info. And now all you got to do, let's bring this one up. Click the set button once you've highlighted it. And now hit the up cross key. Let's bring it up right next to each other. Hit the set key again. Hit menu to exit. Hit save and exit. And now let's go to the quick menu and look at that, side by side. So now that's a more manageable quick menu if you ask me. Great. What else can we do? Well, as I said, I often leave subject tracking on because it's so darn good. So if I have it on, I have no spot autofocus box, period. The spot autofocus box, remember what happened to that? There it is right there. It doesn't work all the time. If I want to shoot the background, it jumps here. It's just, it's out of control. I have to have a spot autofocus box. And so to do that, let's set the AF on button to be my dedicated spot autofocus box. And we'll, we'll turn off subject tracking through this button. Let's go into it. Let's go find it. So let's go to big camera. Let's go to number three, customize buttons. Let's go scroll until we find that AF on button. Is that it? No, you're in the movie column. Go back. There you go. Push the Q button in. And so it's set as we said already. It's set automatically to meter and autofocus start. But look, there's an info and detail set button. Ah, let's go hit that. And this is why it doesn't really do anything, because nothing is checked. This huge menu, there's nothing checked or set. So let's make some use of this. Let's change the autofocus area, a.k.a. autofocus point, a.k.a. autofocus method, a.k.a. autofocus box. Let's put it to the one I use the most. And this will change. I can change this when I'm in the field. But most of the time, you want this smallest autofocus box called spot autofocus. Click set. Great. Nothing's going to happen because I haven't went over here and checked it yet. So I've done that before and thought this doesn't work. 
So now subject tracking, check that. And we want to turn this off because it goes outside of the box. So now it's off. Now let's follow the prompts out. Menu, click set, means OK. Great. So now watch what happens. I want to shoot the shoulder of the ego. Subject tracking is going FU. I'm going to shoot the eye. It's not behaving. If you really want to take control, now just press your AF on button. Now you have your spot autofocus and subject tracking is off. As long as I hold that down, I'm the boss. If I let go of that, then subject tracking is the boss. I'm no longer the boss. I want to take a picture of the chest of this eagle. Spot focus says, oh no, you're not going to take a picture of the chest of this barn owl. You're going to take a picture of its eye because I'm the boss. If I, if I want to be the boss, then I just push down the AF on button, and now I'm the boss. I'm going to take a picture of the chest of that ego. See how that works? All right, guys, that'll do it. That's my current setup, and I really like it the way it is. So again, my setup is the MFN button will toggle between the autofocus points. I leave subject tracking on, and you can see it messes up my autofocus points. But if I really need an autofocus point, like I have my heart on getting a picture of the chest of this eagle, I have the AF on button to go autofocus point, the smallest one called spot focus. And I have it so it shuts off the subject tracking and I can get that, get that shot that I want. Let's do one more thing now that I'm toggling between these. There's too many of them. We don't need all of these. So let's just keep three of them. How do I get rid of them? So if I go into menu and we go back to autofocus and if we go to number four, limit autofocus areas. If you come here, you just uncheck the ones you don't want. Well, I don't need a spot focus because I already have one set up on the AF on button. Um, this is a single point another single point with a couple helper boxes. If I'm going to use a single point, I want all the helper boxes. I use this for the eagle flying out of the nest. Zone one, I can use. Uh, zone two, I can use. I don't need three zones. And I very, unless I'm shooting swallows or something that's really hard to keep in the frame of the camera, I really don't use that one either. But it would depend on what type of bird I'm shooting, which one of these I leave on. But this is my kind of my stock right here. So go down, click OK, or this won't work. All right, now when I toggle, we can see the three I have. Where's the spot? The spot is the AF on button. There's my dedicated spot. Okay, you could set the star button up to do things as well. I leave that stock so I can change my aperture here or my F number. How do I change my ISO? Remember I tweaked that. So... The quick control dial changes my ISO for me, which I'm constantly writing. Great. Shutter speed is still the main dial here. Eye on, eye off. That's the DOF button on the front. All right, guys, I hope you liked the video. Give me a thumbs up. If you have any questions, leave them down below. I'm pretty smart with this EOS R7 right now. I'm going to move on to the EOS R8 next, so I'll probably lose some of my smartness with it. So now's the time to ask questions. Um, I'll still probably be able to get them answered. And I mean everything, if you went through this whole video, you can pick up any one of these, these EOS R cameras, and they're all going to be similar. So this wasn't specific. When we go to the EOS R8, a lot of the stuff's going to be exactly the same. If you buy EOS R, a lot of it's going to be the same. So um, it's if you've made it this far, you've done well. And this information will carry over to the next EOS R camera you buy. All right, guys, don't forget to subscribe, new channel. Um, I have a whole bunch of videos coming out where I put all different types of lenses on this EOS R7. I put a 100-400, a 100-500 RF mounts, a 800 prime RF mount. Then I put those up against a EF300 prime with a 1.4 teleconverter, with a 2.0 teleconverter. I mean, that's like $6,000, $6,500 setup. You know, versus a $600 setup. What is that going to show you? So subscribe to the channel if you want to see that video. It'll be out probably within a month. It takes me, because I'm a full-time professor, so I still have my teaching duties. So I don't do this full-time. Uh, but I sure do love it. Anyway, thanks for watching. See you in the next video.